503 years ago, that Augustinian monk from Wittenberg, Germany, little tiny out-of-the-way town, walked to the castle church where he actually served as the parish priest and he nailed that notice to that front door. That notice contained the 95 theses, the 95 statements, and the target of those was really the practice of selling indulgences that give the forgiveness of sins. After 503 years, why do we spend one Sunday every single year, why do we spend so much time going that far back in history to remember that day? In 503 years, a lot has changed. But it's not just remembering that. We still sing songs from back then that were composed at that time. We even study from the catechism that was written that long ago. Is the accusation that we are, are pitifully out of touch with our modern age. Is that accusation true? Well, that accusation would be true if the things that we hold on to are only customs and traditions made by human beings. I mean, if that were the case, we would be nothing more than a curiosity, a quaint little sect going about our business in our own little corner of the world, beyond the reach of the people around us. But that's not true, is it? Because the things we hold on to are the unchanging truths of God's word. We celebrate Reformation every year to impress upon us how important these truths are and how important it is that we pass these on to the next generation and the generation after that and to all people of our day, these, these great treasure that God has given the church through Dr. Martin Luther and through the Reformation that he carried out 500 years ago. If the gospel which God proclaims, if the gospel which God proclaims in the Bible is to bring our children, our grandchildren, and others the same joy and hope and, and comfort and assurance that Luther found in the crucified and risen Christ, we have found too, then we have to pass this message on to them clearly and firmly and definitely. It said that we're always one generation away from losing the gospel. And this is true. But this idea of passing this on, this, this is out of step with our times and the world we live in today. The overwhelming message of the, of the church today is a vague, uncertain, and indefinite thing that produces confusion and doubt. Martin Luther was such a wonderful tool that God used because he spoke in clear certain terms in a way that even children could understand God's truth. He knew exactly what he was talking about and others could understand exactly what he had to say. His message came across in his day and age like a clear trumpet blast in the confusion of his day. He understood what Paul meant in the words that we're studying this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8. Paul wrote, If the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? And as we take these words to heart this morning, our message too will be a clear trumpet blast. It'll give every generation a standard of right and wrong that is unchanging. And it gives a foundation of faith that is solid. See, in Luther's day, the church had done a really good job of forgetting and covering up the principles of right and wrong that God has made clear and certain in his word. And instead, they had invented a, a new kind of, of holiness of their own making and form by which they wanted to please God and find eternal happiness. Even Luther grew up believing in these things. Luther grew up believing that being a faithful monk was a guarantee of heaven. He honest, honestly believed that doing things like going barefoot in the snow, especially in winter, wearing uncomfortable clothing, doing things like starving himself, beating himself, denying himself a wife, living in poverty. He believed that these were actually things that were the most God-pleasing things that a person could do to earn his favor. And Luther tried with all of his heart. He became a model monk, desperately tried to find peace for his soul by, by doing things like tormenting his body. But for all his sincerity, at the time he complained that the more often we wash, the dirtier we become. And years later, when he looked back on this chapter of his life, he said that the holier we became as monks, 
the more we became children of the devil, that's because the, the, the true right and wrong of God's word had been obscured. And the things that he had learned were good weren't actually what God had said. And as Luther studied the Bible, the Holy Spirit led him to the truth, the pure light of the gospel. And that's when he also began to see God's standard of right and wrong as God intended it to be seen. He learned what we today can, can hardly imagine forgetting. That if you want to please God, you have to do what God tells you in the way that he tells you to do it. Luther saw that the only sure guide for human holiness is the law of the Lord. And that's when he began to give back to the church the standard of right and wrong that was fixed by God's will and not invented by people. So when Luther did things like calling people out of monasteries and convents of Germany, he did it because he could find nothing in God's word that said a monastic life was pleasing to God or that it earned salvation. When he told them that it was proper for them to break their vows of celibacy, their, their promises of celibacy and get married, he did it because he couldn't find anything in God's word that said it was a sin for a priest to be married. And that being celibate was more, or that being celibate was more pleasing to God and that it helped eternal life. As the Catholic Church, as Pope Gregory VII had decreed, he learned that these teachings were nothing but teachings of men that only confused people about what was right and wrong in God's eyes, an unclear trumpet blast. And it doesn't take much to see that many Christians are, are still confused about right and wrong today. You look at the, the, the statements of many Christians today. They say they base their Christian life on the Bible. But when it comes to issues like abortion and euthanasia, which we're seeing have a, a growing popularity, they, they base their decisions on feelings about these things and they reject the Bible's clear teaching on the sanctity of life. Many Christians rightly claim the Bible as their authority and not the decrees of the Pope. Yet in the same breath, many Christians, they will defend and even, will excuse and even defend homosexuality and, and sex before marriage and no-fault divorce, all of which are clearly condemned by God's word. Many Christians today claim that the life they live conforms with what the Bible says a Christian's life should look like, but then they give no second thought about commands for us about God's commands for, for us, the, the people of his church, to help the poor, to help the outcasts, to be a friend to people whose lives are hurt by sin, whether their own or others. And not because sin isn't bad, but because God wants us to work for love. He wants us to work for justice. These are things that God wants us to do. And it has to be confusing to, to children and to many other people when they see Christians today rejoicing that the Bible isn't chained to a pulpit like it was in Luther's day. But it can be owned by everybody. You can access it on your phones and on your computers. Yet at the same time, they can't make a true claim to live by the teachings so clearly fixed in God's word or even be bothered to learn them or to apply them to life. The, Lu the church of Luther's day needed a, a clear standard of right and wrong that came from God himself and not the whims of one man who claimed authority over God's word. And the same is true today. The church today, of our day, it needs to be set free from a system of, of right and wrong that's based on people's idea of right and wrong. Many Christians today have fallen into the trap of the devil's lie that if it feels right, then it must be the thing that you pour your heart and soul into and that it's okay for that to be your reason for living. Luther called people to bind their consciences to God's word alone. When we disobey God's standard of right and wrong, that's when we sin. We're not supposed to be happy about it. We're not supposed to make sure we feel good about it. Our conscience is supposed to be terrified when it sees God's law because heaven and hell are as real as the house next door. The church today must sound a trumpet that gives a clear and definite sound. God has given us his law by which he himself tells us what he wants, a law that demands from us perfect obedience and threatens us with hell when we disobey, the law that announces the real wrath of God and proclaims that punishment is certain for lawbreakers. 503 years ago, God's law was clear. 
And every sinner stood condemned for his sin. And that law in God's word is just as clear today. At the same time, as God's law was needing to be made clear by Martin Luther, the important question on Martin Luther's mind was, how shall I ever find a gracious God? He was tormented by his sin. When he looked to see what what God said about sin and what people are, it led him to actually start hating God because he saw that there was no way he could live up to that standard. How will I ever find a gracious God? Well, God led him to that answer, and he used him to share that answer with the church, a trumpet that gave a clear and certain call, not about a a God who is an angry tyrant, but about a gracious God. See, the same Bible that was clear, absolutely clear about sin and where we stand in God's sight also has more important words and promises that guarantee our salvation. You and I have known this from from when we were little. But in Luther's day, that that, that message was muddy and it was uncertain. Many had turned away from the Bible's simple message. They They turned away from believing that something so simple, it just couldn't be from God. Because God is is deep and God is mysterious. So they started trying to find some deeper, more important, more spiritually, spiritual meaning message hidden behind the words of the Bible. And they came to believe that only a trained and gifted theologian with, with a vivid imagination could really know and interpret what the Bible had to say. But with all those opinions out there, they realized that they needed something to keep to keep it in check. So they decided that only only the Pope could figure out which interpretation was correct. Well, Luther made a discovery that, again, seems absolutely obvious to us. The Bible says what it says. And that's what it means. God didn't give us his word to confuse us or to mislead us. But he gave it to us to make us wise for salvation, as Paul says, from infancy. And that doesn't mean that we're always going to understand everything we read. But what it does mean is that the more we learn his word, the better we'll know and understand what he has done for us through Jesus Christ. And that's what makes the Bible a book, not only for pastors and professors, but for every single person who is living. And once again, this truth, it's being lost in the, in the church of our time. It's even being destroyed by Lutherans who tell us that The real meaning of the Bible can be discovered only by trained scholars and theologians. The Bible, they say, is true, but it's all full of mistakes and myths and legends, and we have to figure out what's what's right and wrong. And if this is true, then the words don't mean what they say, and it's up to you to figure out which scholar and which theologian to believe. And the result of this kind of thinking, in the end, the Bible becomes once more what it was many years ago, a trumpet that gives an uncertain sound. And because this is happening, the major portion of the Lutheran church today needs a reformation as radical as the Roman Catholic Church needed in Luther's day. What makes this so important is what the Bible actually is for us. The words in the Bible are the only path to the cross of Jesus Christ. And when this is obscured, people are left hopeless. What we need to understand, what we need to keep on teaching is that the words of the gospel written in the Bible They're the only way that God has given us to put us in touch with the Savior who was crucified for our sins, the Christ, who is the only foundation for our faith. I know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loved me, a sinner, died for me. And I know that only because the words of the Bible tell me this. I know that his suffering has set me free from the punishment that that my sins deserve because, again, the Bible tells me this. I know that his blood washes away my sins, makes me perfect in God's sight. Only because God's word tells me this. I know that God's death, Jesus Christ's death on that cross gives me eternal life. Because God's word tells me this. You can't find out who Jesus is by taking some kind of a spiritual journey. But returning to those words of the children's hymn that are so simple but so important. Jesus loves me, this I know Or the Bible tells me so. Friends, you and I know this message because God's clear trumpet sound has reached our ears. May God help us continue to send this sound forth in our church, in the lives of the people that we live with today. Amen. Please stand.
The peace of God which transcends all understanding. Let it guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven. Our Father, almighty ruler over all things, we, your children, by faith in Christ Jesus, pray to you with confidence and joy. Keep us from dishonoring you by false teaching and ungodly living. Help us to cling to your pure and precious word and to lead a life which is pleasing to you. Keep us in faith by your grace that we may remain members of your kingdom, the Holy Christian Church. Fill our hearts with a concern for souls and bless the work of all who preach and spread your saving word, that your kingdom may grow and prosper. Destroy the plans of the devil and all the enemies who seek to rob us of our life with you. In all things, help us to obey you as gladly as do the angels in heaven. When you lead us in ways which seem dark and mysterious, grant that we may surrender our will to yours. Give us today our daily bread. Provide for us each day with what we need for our lives and make us truly content and grateful for what you give us. Move us to cast all our care on you because you care for us. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus, put away our sins and make us clean by his blood and death. Move us by your great love to forgive those who wrong or grieve us. us Suppress Satan's power when he tries to tempt us. If at first we listen to his voice, give us wisdom to detect his trickery and strength to overcome him. Shield us from harm. When we do face adversity and endure trouble, help us to carry our burdens with patience and trust, knowing that you work out all things for our good. Finally, when our last hour comes, take us to our home in heaven. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. 